Welcome to our ongoing discussion of types of structural action. We're going to shift our attention to conceptualizing the structural system. In other words, we're going to start asking ourselves, how do we put tension and compression and bending and torsional elements together to create a, an economical, rational, sturdy structural system that has architectural merit? And one of the concepts we're going to introduce is the notion of mutually bracing sheets of material. And usually, I often refer to this as perpendicular planes of material because we, in our culture, tend to build rectilinear uh, Cartesian type structures. But we really need to be a little more general if we want to be creative in our structural design and we want to talk about mutually bracing sheets of material. And we'll discover that a concept of a sheet of material, a stable sheet of material, is a very complicated and subtle thing which gives us uh, a wide latitude of creativity. All right, so we talked previously about this notion that we can take this sheet of material and set it up on edge and give it some kind of beam-like properties, although it doesn't tend to work too well because it may be strong relative to forces in this direction, but it's very weak relative to forces that way. And also it's not very well braced. So in fact here, under a gravity force, it's actually tending to start moving to the side because it's not sufficiently stiff to be stable under that influence. Um, then we talked about how we can nail down sheets of plywood to these two by 10 boards and that in fact the boards not only support the plywood against gravity but the gravity return the plywood returns the favor by stabilizing the compression material in the top of the beam so here we have a sheet of material that's represented by uh, this beam uh, you don't think of it as a sheet of material but it's very strong in one direction it's relatively weak in the other direction and now it is connecting to this decking, which is very strong edge on, but not so strong in that direction. In fact, if this decking wasn't supported very frequently along these lines of these uh, beams underneath, it would collapse downward. So here we have mutually bracing sheets of material that are creating a coherent structural whole. So um, the other thing we talked about is we could take this sheet of material and instead of stabilizing it by the decking, we can stabilize it with uh, flange elements like this, which is typically what we do in steel. And interestingly enough, in steel, we not only use the flanges for lateral stabilization, but we also weld the decking down to it so we get even greater lateral stabilization. And to some degree, the flange is merely a means of keeping the web vertical and also it provides a surface to which we could weld the decking. If we could figure out a way to assemble it without the flanges, we could have decking welded directly to a vertical plate. But generally speaking, from a sort of assembly and handling point of view, the wide flanges are much more desirable because we can easily lift them up and they're straight and they hold their shape until we get the decking welded down to them. All right, so that wide flange it looks like this and basically we have this sheet of material on the top. We have a sheet of material on the bottom and we have this web that represents a sheet of material and those things are connected together to each other so that they are mutually stabilizing. So we have mutually uh, bracing sheets of material. Here's another example. We can take a thin sheet and we can bend it into corrugation. So we got a sheet that goes that way. We got a sheet across here. We've got another one down here that we can't see too well. But these things are mutually bracing planes and we produce something that's very sturdy and very structurally efficient through corrugation. It's only strong in one direction though. It can't span this way. It's got to have a support under every one of these flutes in order to function effectively. 
And that's one of the things you need to be keenly aware of when you do your structural design is that you're designing a steel structure. Um, it's, and if you're using corrugated decking, uh, it only goes one way. You can't support it with any kind of point force. It has to be supported periodically along lines and the only direction it spans in is this direction. It has no strength to span that way. Okay, so here's a uh, classic sort of structural concept. We call this post and beam. We have a couple of vertical posts. Um, with a beam spanning between them. Uh, inherently, the really weak part of this is right there, but this whole system is poor in this direction, but works pretty well for forces edge on to it. Uh, in other words, going into the direction of this picture. Um, so we can nail a bunch of these things together and try to make some kind of connection. And the typical way we do it is like that. Now, those connections are very, very poor. Uh, we got some nails coming up through here and some nails going down through there, but those are almost pin joints. And to illustrate the point, we've put this uh, series of studs together in that conventional way, and then this person is going to exert a force, and with one finger, he's able to push these over. Now he could have pushed them all the way over, but we didn't want to damage our wall, so we stopped right there. But the point is that the amount of deflection in this direction at the top of this structure is so great that we would never claim that this is a satisfactory structure. And in fact, when you go by buildings that are being built in this stick-built manner, you'll often see a bunch of cross braces and diagonal elements that are going out into the yard and they're anchored in the yard via stakes. Those are the things that are necessary to even keep this flimsy structure up and hold it vertical until we can do something to stabilize it. So by itself, these elements, which are edgewise quite strong, uh, have no strength in this direction. So what we do is we come along and we nail some sheathing to that, which might be oriented strand board, which is what this is, or it can be plywood. And now when we've stabilized that wall in this manner, this person who could push those things over with one finger before cannot now, with all the strength of his body, make any appreciable impact on it. In fact, you'll notice something. This base piece was flat, and he's pushing as hard as he can, and this element is pulling up, and the deformation is all occurring in the curvature of this bottom piece. So if that's properly anchored down, this is going to be an extremely sturdy structure. And also, if you repeat um, this bay on the next bay over and several more bays, you'll have an unbelievably sturdy structure. So again, this is an example of perpendicular sheets of material. You may not think of these 2x4s as sheets, but that's a sheet which is its thickest dimension is into the direction of this and this is a sheet perpendicular to it, and these things assembled together are making an extremely serviceable wall. Uh, it's unbelievable. Oriented strand board is really inexpensive. Two by fours are really inexpensive, and yet we're able to produce extremely serviceable structures by nailing these things together so that they are mutually bracing. Now, we can take this mutually bracing concept to the scale of the building. So far, we've been talking about uh, sort of components like a wide flange or corrugated decking or uh, shear walls made out of oriented strand board and two by fours. But we can literally do this at the scale of the entire building. So here we have a wall cantilevering up out of the ground, and it has a fairly narrow footing, typical of what you might have to just provide adequate bearing surface. Um, this wall by itself, by the way, can't be built very, very tall before the stresses on the soil allow this thing to sort of keel over. Uh, one of the most common sources of death on construction sites are unbraced walls, which people think they can just build them indefinitely high because there is no force there to tip gravity. But they will buckle, they will fail the foundations in the sense that 
the material in the foundations will be soft enough to allow this rotation to occur. It might not drive the wall down into the ground, but it will allow the wall to rotate. So if we come along and simulate a force here on the side of that, you notice that this thing is tilting over with essentially no force required. Now, we can come and put some perpendicular walls. So now we've got this wall that we've been talking about, and we've got this person with the finger pushing on the wall, but now this wall has been stabilized by two mutually bracing sheets of material that come and connect to it. So they back it up. So these material, this material is strong in that direction. In other words, edge on to the material, as is this one in both those directions, they're strong. This one is relatively weak due to forces in that direction. It's a lot better than it was. I mean, this person's really exerting some force there, whereas before she could not even feel the, the wall on her finger. The force was so feathery light. So now she's pushing, it's curving, it's bending, and we're seeing some structural action in that it's supported at each end and it's bending in between. But we don't want to span that whole distance if we can span less than that. So what we're going to do is we're going to come along and put a diaphragm roof on it, or it might be a diaphragm floor as part of a multi-story building. But we put that diaphragm on, and now when she pushes on this wall with her finger, the material is spanning from the lower edge or the foundation up to this upper edge, which is stabilized by this roof diaphragm. By the way, we call it a roof diaphragm. Um, we'll talk about diaphragms frequently. Uh, we call this a shear wall right here uh, for any forces in that direction. This is a shear wall and the other one in the other side is a shear wall. Um, what a diaphragm roof is, is it's a beam which we got for nothing. In other words, we had to have some kind of enclosure up there or some sort of decking. And it turns out that decking, which was there, put there to keep the snow out or provide a floor for people to walk on or whatever its function is, that decking, if it's designed properly, will be a nice strong beam that backs up this wall and basically takes whatever force this finger is exerting and transfers that force over to the top of this wall and then the wall transfers that force down to the footing. And there's a diagram of this, which you can study for a while. It's a fairly subtle concept, but it shows how all the different parts and pieces are influencing each other. In this case, we've shown a wind pressure on this wall, uh, a wind suction on this back wall, and we've shown how all those uh, stresses or forces get distributed through the system in this box-like structure, which consists, by the way, of four walls and a roof, uh, all of which represent sheets or planes of material that are mutually bracing. So here's a, a somewhat, something of a variation. We Again, we have our three shear walls, but now instead of a sheet of material like concrete or something like that for the roof diaphragm, we have corrugated material, which is what we would typically use for steel. When this person exerts a force on the wall, the corrugations which are coming into that in this, their strong direction, they're able to take compression in that direction really well. Uh, so the corrugations are doing the job of taking the force that's delivered to this wall and transferring that force over to the side here. So the, this roof is working as a diaphragm roof. In this direction, though, it's not so good because now these corrugations uh, start to act a little like an accordion. And so when this person pushes, there is a sort of buckling or warping phenomenon that's taking place there. And normally that would be really disturbing, except that all across here, there are going to be spanning elements like trusses. God, I, I got to get myself something I can draw with. Um, those are supposed to be straight lines representing beams down underneath this decking and the beams stop this accordion effect from occurring. But just to demonstrate it, we, we glued one little piece of, of uh, board, um, chipboard to the bottom of the corrugations and now when this person exerts a force with her finger, 
uh, the corrugations are working collectively together to produce a really nice diaphragm action. So corrugated decking, even though at first glance you might think it's not a very good diaphragm, but when you add up all the bits and pieces of the roof that are working together, uh, it works really well as a diaphragm. Okay, so this shows a simple building with the four shear walls and the diaphragm roof. Um, if we if we made this part of a basement, we'd have all the forces of the soil pushing in on the walls in every direction. So we'd have a force this way, a force that way, one that way, and then one coming in from the other side. Under those circumstances, this diaphragm roof and all the structure underneath it, the structure that's running in this direction, all that works really well in compression to resist these forces. Sometimes, though, we just want to have uh, a retaining wall on one side, which basically is creating a very large uh, surcharge on this side. And I've actually seen examples of buildings that skidded in this direction because the buildings weren't heavy enough to resist that load. And of course, typically when they start skidding, they also start cracking apart. So sometimes we don't want to take this big surcharge from the soil and have it ricochet through this entire structure. We like to just build all this structure kind of in conventional ways. So we'd like to stop this problem right here. And we have a way of doing that. This would be a simple wall with a little narrow base like we would normally put just as a bearing surface to support whatever gravity loads are coming down on the top of this wall. If we start putting soil up against that, it, it just uh, keels over really easily. It was never designed to resist rotation in this direction. It was just designed to resist these vertical gravity forces. So we have to rethink this whole wall and we have to do two things to it. We have to make the wall itself much thicker and then we have to attach it to a base and we need to make that base much wider. And we're going to make it wider back in this direction so that it works kind of like a bookend in the old uh, libraries where you would sit books on the base of the metal bookend and the weight of the books actually help keep this rotation from occurring. So we're going to use the weight of the soil to do that. So this shows that kind of, this is called a cantilevered retaining wall. And so it's cantilevering up out of the base. So here you see the footer and here you see the wall and you'll notice they're both quite thick. You'll also notice that the footer is really wide and there is some really crucial reinforcement that occurs because this wall wants to keel over and it's got to have lots of tensile steel on the back side here which has to be very connect, well connected down in the basement base uh, but also this wall wants to just skid along the surface here so there will also be some tension rebar that's helping or diagonal rebar that's helping to keep that from happening when we get to the point of talking about these kinds of retaining walls we'll go into more detail but for right now, if you had some soil that you wanted to retain, here's how it works. So here we've got that wide base. And here we got the moment connected wall. So the wall is coming down and there's a really good moment connection right there. And now the weight of this uh, soil is pressing down on this footing like so. And that's helping to resist this overturning moment which is coming from the lateral force of all that soil. So that concludes our first installment on the notion of mutually bracing sheets of material, or so far we've been talking pretty much about perpendicular planes of material. But now in our next video, we want to talk about more subtle configurations.